Hi there. We are Jim and Jonna Schuster, and this is a glimpse into our world. Conversations from our living room. Unscripted, without agenda, prompted by the Holy Spirit. And usually over coffee. About what God is saying to us right now. No promises on what you'll get. Rev bombs, rants, breakthroughs, victories. It's all fair game. But we hope it's a place of encountering the depths of the Lord together. So come explore with us here on the Catholic Revival Ministries podcast. We are so excited to welcome a special guest to our podcast today, Deacon Keith Strom. Keith is a deacon of the Archdiocese of Chicago, and he's the founder of M3 Ministries, which is having incredible impact across the world, helping parishes transform into a culture of dynamic discipleship. Keith is a rare gem and a person of profound faith, insight, and wisdom, and we know you're going to love hearing from him just as much as we enjoyed talking to him. You can find more information about M3 Ministries in our show notes, but for now, we invite you to join us for our conversation with Deacon Keith Strom. So Keith, it's nice to have you in, in our conversation here. Jim and I normally have this on the couch with our coffees and it's, you know, just one-on-one, but we're really excited to hear what's God saying to you lately, what's he doing in your life and all of that. Oh, well, it's great to be here, actually. I wish we could all be together around your couch, right? That would be amazing, yes. uh, <laughs> uh, but I am here in Illinois. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've really been hearing from the Lord a lot, it really began the end of last year, but it sort of repeated in the last uh, month or two, is the need for me to really spend more time with him. There's an invitation there. Mm -hmm. Um, I do a lot of work in healing and deliverance. Mm -hmm. Um, And at one point, the Lord said to me very clearly, you spend more time with the enemy than you do with me. Oh, wow. Um, And so uh, that was a word of correction for me, for sure. And so for me, that's been the, that's been the, it's there, it's invitation, right? The Lord has been yeah. inviting me into not even, you know, even deep moments of prayer, but, but really spending time. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's been the call of my, that's been the call of my heart. And I've been missing that. And I've realized it's so easy in ministry to be so busy yeah. doing yeah. ministry that you kind of get disconnected from that foundational relationship. Yeah. Uh, and I think the Lord's calling me back really to kind of recall, you know, my first love. Yeah. Right, just going back to the, those yeah. days when sometimes I would just think about him, mm. uh, n- you know, not heavy prayer, just thinking about him and and kind of I don't know what you want to call it, like raising my affections, you know, yeah. for him and and experiencing that love. So mm. I think for me, that's really where it's where it's been heading for sure. Yeah. Have you noticed a difference then since heeding yes. that call? Yes, so. I have. Um, I, you know, we, we've talked about this off the podcast, but just recently I had COVID and pneumonia mm. and uh, had a lot of time in recovery. And, you know, St. Ignatius of Loyola had these incredible experiences in yeah. his illness. I uh, maybe not as much. Uh, <laughs> I, ha- I haven't come up with a whole system of discernment and, and anything <laughs> like that. Um, but yes, that just kind of having that quiet time where I'm not running around it was just recovering even from pneumonia itself was like, I just, I couldn't do a lot. Uh, yeah. And so just being able to just sit and be present, it was like relearning that kind of, I, I almost want to call it a skill. I mean, obviously the yeah. Holy spirit is at work in our hearts to bring us to stillness, but mm-hmm. that habit mm-hmm. of, of being still um, of, of clearing space in life. Uh, I think I sort of rediscovered that. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, praise God. That's the, I, I you know, I, I, I don't want to say that getting COVID and pneumonia was a really great thing. I'd rather not do it again, but, yeah. um, but I'll tell you what, that was a, that was a real gift that came out of it for me. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I, I love what you said just about that idea of getting back to the first love. And I feel like that's just a theme that we've been seeing uh, throughout the body of Christ. Like there's so many people who yeah. in so many circles where, Uh, They're talking about this. And I feel like even just the whole, you know, last year of COVID was, you know, we all got kind of thrown for a loop, right? And and it was so easy to kind of get distracted and get focused on other things that, you know, and I, I just feel like almost with the turn of the year, it was almost like collectively, we as a church have been like, Hey, let's let's remember. Let's get back to what is kind of the basics and the normal, and just again that first love, like you know, really setting our hearts on the Lord and getting our focus on that instead of on all the craziness around us. Well, I think there's also an application of first love actually being Jesus, and yeah. I've noticed that with 
all of the shutdowns and everything that's been messed up because of the restrictions and everything, our programs and our structures and everything is, it's all had to shift. And I think part of the, I mean, it's a frustration to have to constantly be changing and re-strategizing and that sort of thing, but it's almost forced us all to, well, I can't say all, but hopefully it's forced us to remember actually what's what's more important than our programs because these programs can just burn at any moment they can just disappear and so mm-hmm. if if we're not pursuing Jesus then what's the point of all this yeah i mean i i'd love to say that like that happens everywhere i think sometimes i i've said it in this way but i think it's i think i'll translate it into kind of what you just said that you know the the lockdown and covid the pandemic really it put people into survival mode and it forced parishes yeah. into maintenance yeah mm-hmm at the very time that they should have been focusing most on mission. Mm. Yeah. Right. And so I think it's the same thing. We can be so focused on survival. So, you know, having the community survive, the structure survive that we can lose sight of Jesus. Yeah. And I think, I think that's the invitation, right? That that's the, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the whole deal about incarnation, right? I mean, in the midst of our suffering, Jesus invites us to turn to him because he's in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's beautiful. And, I, and my, that's my hope and prayer, too, that the church has uh, heeded that call to return, or at least individuals in the church, um, mm-hmm. because I think that's where we're going to see fruit in the future as well, right? I mean, the f- fruit will be born from that as opposed to simply, hey, we managed to keep, you know, our funds, our budget in the midst of yeah. COVID. I mean, that, you know, that's yeah. important, too, in a certain dimension, but but everything is rooted in this. Yeah, one way you were talking about being in survival mode, and that definitely describes the way I have felt for a significant amount of time. And that is actually kind of what I had in mind coming into the podcast that like, what's been going on in my life recently that has, uh, where's the Lord showing up. And one of those areas is just, I've I've been re I've been connecting with people a little bit more. It's still remote. It's still over zoom and whatnot, but I've got a, you know, a couple of like small group type of uh, things that I'm involved with and simply having the opportunity to tell other people about the good things going on in my life Mm. has been so beneficial to me because for so much of my recent past, I've been focused on the problems. I've been like, you know, I've got another problem to solve. There's this other thing that hasn't hasn't quite worked out yet. I'm still trying to get somewhere with this thing. And it's been kind of consuming it. But simply having another person, of course, John and I are sharing everything real time. (laughs) Um, but, uh, But having the opportunity to actually tell other people, you know, actually, usually it starts with, Oh, the, you know, this is hard and this thing's going wrong and I, I don't really know what's going to happen here. I'm kind of worried about this. Oh, but there is this other thing, you know, I guess that that was that's going OK. That's going decently. And actually, there's some really good uh, momentum growing in this area. And oh, this other thing happened to me the other day. And the little by little, right. I'm remembering but just by telling my story to somebody else. I'm remembering the good things that are actually happening. And it's mm-hmm. getting my my attention off of the worries and back yeah. on to. God has this, like, look at, look at what he's actively doing in my life. And it brings me back to just Jesus talking about like, consider the flowers of the field, like, eh, and the sparrows and whatnot, the birds, if the Lord, you know, if your father can provide for all these, how much more will he provide for you? And it's like, oh yeah, that's happening. Eh." And it's not even just like, oh, I'm trusting that one day that will happen. It's just like, oh, wait, it is happening. I can see it if I can just get my attention off. But I I think the key for me has actually been getting out of the isolation that I've been in Mm -hmm. and getting into into conversation with with people where I can actually start telling them because then I'm not, um, I'm also hearing myself say it. And I'm like, oh, wow, (laughs) that's really awesome. That's right. This is happening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I I mean, that's beautiful. And, And, you know, obviously the Lord's in the midst of that. And I think it brings up a kind of a, it, it is a kind of a spiritual discipline, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. To be, to be able to speak about fruit, mm-hmm. right? Cause you're, you're right. I mean, everything, you know, for the past year and a half, even really, it's kind of been heavy for people. Yeah. Um, and, and it is easy to just get trapped in the, oh, this and that and that it's just, this is going bad. And, but when we focus on fruit, right. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's this whole thing of testimony, right. Yeah. yeah. Where it, it changes the spiritual atmosphere of our way. Yeah. Like, right. I think one Christian speaker said it like this, like if you had to translate what testimony meant, it would be do it again, Lord. 
right? Oh, that, I love that. That, that. That basically when we share what God has done in the past, yeah, uh, it makes it present, right? Yeah. And we sh- and when we share what God is doing now, it makes it present for the people who are hearing it. And I think that's a spiritual yeah. discipline we need to mm-hmm. probably focus on more, but it's also yeah. a way of cooperating with the Lord. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. You begin to do that. And not only does your heart change, right, but other people are invited into, right, this kind of awe at what God is doing. And it, and it yeah. might recall, then they might be like, hey, you know what, this other thing is happening in my life. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think it's beautiful. And I can see that being driven by, you know, when we're isolated, we're not talking. Yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, yeah. you know, my wife, Debbie and I do and, and you guys do. But when you're with, you know, people you haven't been with in a while. Yeah. Right. And they always ask the question, how's it going for you? Right. And most yeah. people just go, oh, fine. Right. Right. But if we could be really specific and be like, oh, you know, this thing is happening. Yeah. I, I, I think it raises, I mean, it does, it changes the spiritual atmosphere. And that's why it's so funny that you bring this up in the work that I do with parishes and with helping to raise up like a generation of missionary leaders. When we meet regularly for formation, mm-hmm. uh, I usually kind of ask them two questions to try to get at this very thing. One is where have you seen God in your life since the last yeah. time we've gathered? Yeah. But two, where are you seeing fruit? Yeah. Uh, either in your ministry or in your spiritual life. Yeah. Um, to kind of almost force the conversation. Yeah. And people, because I think especially like when we kind of do the work that we do, uh, walking alongside of individuals or with parishes, I mean, it is constantly, it's like, oh, this thing is happening. This didn't go yeah. well, or, yeah. you know, th- this is a, this is a difficulty we're facing and people just easily lose sight of it. So I'm so, I'm yeah. grateful to hear that that's been a thing that God is like reigniting in your heart as you do this. Yeah. That reminds me too of um, when Jim and I were working in parish ministry, we would have staff meetings regularly. And there was a point at which I intentionally started shifting. So the staff meeting was normally go around the table and report how things are going for your ministry. What, what are you, and it, basically that turned into what are you working on? What are, yeah. what are the tasks that you're doing and what are the numbers that are coming in and that sort of thing. And I, at a certain point, I just started feeling convicted. You know what? I'm going to share what God is doing, not what I'm doing. And I don't know the impact that it had on the rest of the staff present, hopefully a good one. But for me, Again, like with Jim, hearing myself sharing those things and preparing in advance, what are the things that I want to report on? It actually stirred up a fire in me. Again, Lord, do it again. And just a reminder of what he's capable of and how he's moving. And I'm I'm here moving pieces around to try to facilitate more space for him to show up and do that stuff. But to talk about it just brought a new life into my own heart. Mm, right. Yeah. Who knows what the effect was on I can see. The pair of staff I'm thinking of, right, the one that uh, not, that I worked with for eight years probably would have been like, what's going on with Jonna? She's acting yeah. a little crazy. Right? <laughs> but but you're right. When you just start speaking about it, um, yeah. oh, it's just so beautiful. I The power of testimony is just something that we underappreciate sometimes um, yeah. in Catholic circles in, in particular, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I think our Protestant brothers and sisters have... Maybe it's it's elevated a little bit more, but we don't often really do that. So we don't talk about in many Catholic parishes, we don't talk about the ways in which God is moving in our life. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm a little puzzled by that. I mean, it took me a while to, like you said, form the discipline of doing that, like looking for it and putting words to it. But I, right. I think there was an obstacle of overcoming a sense of, well, I don't want to brag or I don't want to sound boastful or, you know, but, you know, not recognizing it's fine to brag about Jesus. It's fine to brag about Mm -hmm. what God is doing. And in fact, it brings hope to people to hear that God is actually alive and doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, though, John, it like could be maybe some people don't want to almost paint themselves as like God's favorite or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like they, oh, well, he's, he did something good for me, but he didn't do it for you. Does that, I'm not trying to claim that I'm better than you because I got this favor from God oh, or something yeah. like, I wonder if that's part of it. Yeah. And, and Keith, I think that's where what you were saying helps to overcome that resistance to, yep. to testimony, because by sharing it, you're not saying, look how much more God loves me than you. Yeah. <laughs> you're saying, he did this for me. He can do it for you too. It's yeah. actually, yeah, I think increased faith around you. I think that's part of Catholic culture, right? Like we know that we know that we're supposed to be faithful and we know that we're supposed to be humble. Right. And for most Catholics, this is what Sherry Waddell would often say from the Catherine Rossian Institute. Like for most Catholics, there are just two, there are only two kinds of Catholics. There's the saints and everyone else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. 
And so I don't want to talk about what God's doing in my life because I don't want you to think I think I'm a saint oh, right? yeah. because yeah. that would be boastful. Right. Yeah. And so there's this there's this culture and in a, and, and in a place in communities where discipleship is not normative. Yeah. Discipleship is seen as extraordinary. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you start talking about what God's doing, it almost seems like, well, you know, you're talking about all these extraordinary ways that God is moving when the reality is, no, he's doing this all the time. Right. This is that's his heart. Yeah. Right. This is how he wants to move uh, if we'll if we'll let him. So that's just kind of part of changing culture is to break that, you know, kind of to yeah. break that boundary down and start talking about what God's doing. And then you realize, oh, he's doing that over there. He's doing that, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, but it is it is this kind of cultural piece where where, you know, I, I guess. And I mean, kind of this, this for me kind of leads into a, a discussion of identity, right? Because it always does for me, like, it just, yeah. like, like who God is and, yeah. and, and who God and what, God, and what this God thinks of me, like shifts and changes everything, right? Yeah. Uh, but we just don't often lean into that. And so we don't like to talk about it. And when we talk about it, I think it, I think, again, it changes the spiritual atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm working with a parish that's starting to do testimonies. Mm -hmm. during the announcement time at mass. Oh, no! that's awesome. Oh, right? I heard of that. love that's that. Great. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and it was awkward at first, but now <laughs> people are getting feedback. Like they're looking because then people go, wow. I mean, if uh, like, I know feedback? you, what are they saying? Uh, the people like, giving testimonies or the, the parish? How are they receiving it? They, so at first it was kind of like, ah, uh, what is this? Right. But now people are looking forward to it. Right. Yeah. They, the, the person giving the testimony often gets great feedback. Like, honestly, like, like that was so amazing. Like, like I was going through a difficult time and, and your testimony just hit exactly or wow. brought light into exactly the place it needed to bring. And like, oh, wow. honestly, and I think people, when we don't have a frame of reference for what discipleship looks like, since, since discipleship is rare, mm -hmm. right, quote unquote, uh, then we don't really have a model. Lay people in particular don't have a model. Um, and, and so all they do is look around and they just assume, well, I guess I have to be like the, the priest or the deacon or the, you know, yeah. and so it's, in, it can be encouraging when they see people who look like them, yeah. right. Who, you know, who they're not priests or deacons or not even, you know, employed at the church, yeah. right. Because people always go, oh, you know, well, you have to say that, right. You're, that's yeah. your thing. You're a professional, right. Uh, it's like everyday people and they, it, it encourages them like, oh, that can be, that can happen to me. Yeah. Right. And I know you, you're normal. Right. I, yeah. I, I, like, you know, uh, even if they're not really normal, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're normal. You look like me. I think we can, you know, I think this is possible. So I think it raises the expectation for people too, for sure. I don't know. Anyway, that's, that, that's I'm, right. I'm talking a lot cause you're just, you, that whole thing about sharing fruit is, it's been so central to the stuff that I've been uh, working with in my ministry because to overcome this kind of yeah. inertia, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, going back to kind of the theme that both of you guys were talking about with COVID and survival mode and all of that, I think what the Lord's been highlighting to me or drawing my attention to is I've just been looking out at all of the problems that have been taking place and it's just out of control. Like everything is so extreme right now. All of the political issues and the cultural issues and relational issues and, you know, everything that's in the news and the reaction of everybody and just even personally having friendships and relationships with people who are deeply, deeply suffering. And mm. there's so much pain, there's so much trauma, and there are problems that basically require Jesus as a solution. Mm -hmm. These are Jesus sized problems. And as hard as we are working to address stuff on the human level, it's, it's not really working or it's working really, really incrementally. And in the meantime, people are still hurting or grieving or it getting hurt anew. And, and so I think the thing that has been coming to my attention is we've got problems that are only getting worse and worse and so not to sound like fatalistic or anything, but we're, I feel like we're in a, maybe a season of our history that stuff is hard and stuff is bad. And Jesus is getting to be the only solution. Like mm. there are friends of mine who have illnesses that are so severe that Jesus is the only solution for them, that medical doctors have given up and Jesus is the only solution. And there are systemic problems out there that Jesus is the only solution. And what that's doing in me is saying, we are the church. And at what point is it going to become 
too much. And we actually have to say, you know what, I can't just sit by and hope that someone figures this out on the human level. But we have to step up, we Mm -hmm. have to start bringing Jesus into these situations. And it's stirring in me a motivation to kind of mobilize the church in in the supernatural realm, like not just, okay, guys, get together and sign petitions and do all this stuff. But no, we need to be fighting the principalities behind these things. Mm -hmm. We need to be bringing Jesus's healing and deliverance to the broken and that sort of thing. That's amazing. Wow. That gets me excited, right? I, I love... I mean, first of all, I love that image, right, of of the church finally kind of stepping into, hey, this is this is mission, right? We've got to, yeah. we we've got to, we have to shine the light of Jesus. We have to shine the healing of Jesus and the and and the you know the deliverance and all of that. We've got to, we've we're supposed to be a channel of of Jesus into the world. We're supposed to be the way in which He reaches the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, at some point we got to actually do something, right? Yeah. Um, yeah like, uh, what's it going to take for us to finally step up and do it? Are the problems bad enough yet that we right. <laughs> we're going to say, okay, it's time to bring Jesus in? Yeah. So uh, I was listening to a speaker talk about, I think it's Matthew. It's it's Matthew sixteen eighteen. Basically, when Jesus makes uh, when Jesus makes the promise to Peter, right? You know, you are rock upon this rock. I'll build my church, and the yeah. gates of the netherworld will never prevail against it. Right? That 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 yeah. sense that we have in the church with this promise that no matter what happens, no matter how the kingdom of darkness kind of is arrayed against us, we're it's never going to overwhelm the church. But I, this one speaker is really breaking it open, and he really talked about you know, well, what do gates do? They keep things out. So <laughs> if 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 we were just talking about keeping out the powers of darkness, Jesus probably would have been talking about the gates of heaven. Yeah. But he was talking. But he was talking about the gates of the netherworld. So, so really, what he, he was saying is, we're not on the defensive; we're on the offensive. Yeah. Right. The, yeah. the the structures that the kingdom of the of darkness has put up to keep the light of Christ out uh, through His body, the church cannot stand. Mm-hmm. Right. They cannot stand. They will be overwhelmed by the by the reality of of God's love in His church. But we have to go forth. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. We we have to take up. We really have to take up that call. And I love that image. And I love kind of your, your sense of we got Jesus sized problems and it's about time for the church to move, not just in the natural, but in the supernatural. That is so encouraging to me. Wow. I'm actually, I'm super excited. Like I'm ready to go do this like right now. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go. (laughs) Honestly, I, and, and I think of sometimes like very, very like Catholic traditions where like Eucharistic processions are sometimes I can think of, you know, no better way of, well, we're just going to go out and Jesus is going to lead us and we're going to go. Right. Mm -hmm. Imagine doing that, not simply as an act of worship, but also as a way of covering the Mm -hmm. the community, covering the streets where you're going in prayer in the presence of Jesus. Right. As you go with Jesus in front, you know, you just intercede then for every house that you see, every person that you see and you live. I mean, that would be amazing. We had an intentionality of doing that, not simply just as an act of devotion, Right, yeah. but as but as an act of uh, intercession, and and not as an act of political grandstanding either. Yeah, that exactly right. You know, like, right. It's not like the monstrances are like you know what's the picket you know sign oh, or right. whatever. It's, <laughs> right. it's not what it is. It's it's actually right. a spiritual reality that we are engaging in to to shift what is going on spiritually in that environment. Yeah. I think I, so you're absolutely right. Right, we're not simply advocating for our religious freedom yeah, to be able yeah. to do this. Right, or we want to we want to change we want to change the climate. Right, we want to yeah. we want to take. You talked about the principalities and powers. Right, we we want to take whatever whatever uh, spirits of the enemy might be assigned to the geographic area. Right, and we want to just you know knock them on their butts in the name of Jesus. Right, I mean that. I don't know. That's I, John. That's like a call to to um uh to spiritual battle. Right, I love yeah. that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, we're the church militant, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. What was kind of jumping at, out at me as you were sharing was just the idea of like, just kind of almost asking the question, is there any problem that's too big for Jesus? Right. Like if there's something that is a concern on our heart and we're worried about it, just to kind of, you know, anything going on in the world or in our lives, whatever, like just bring it back to that question. Is there any problem that's too big for Jesus? So that's kind of number one, getting getting clear about who he is, you know, Keith yep. kind of coming back to this whole identity, yep. identity piece, getting clear about who he is. Yep. But then on the flip side of that, also not letting that thought lead us into passivity. And what I mean by that is 
not standing back and saying, oh, yeah, well, Jesus can take care of this if he wants to. You know, if, of course he can do it. Of course he could do that. But recognizing that he actually wants this to be a collabor- collaborative process. He wants yeah. to get us involved. He wants us to be yep. co-laboring with him and and for him to be moving through us. And so a lot of times we, we talk about like if, if God has really put a, some kind of maybe it's a justice issue on your heart or just something you're really passionate about. It's actually a clue that he wants to use you in that area in particular that, um, and so I think there's just a lot of space for just exploring with God, um, and just saying, all right, Lord, what does it actually look like for us to partner together? What, what Mm. steps do you want me to take and how can I invite you to work through me in this area? I think that's beautiful, right? Because I, I think sometimes in the church, we kind of engage in magical thinking, mm-hmm. right? And magical thinking says, yeah, Jesus can take care of it. We're good, yeah, right? Yeah. We don't have to do much, Jesus. And, and and whereas, again, I don't know, there's so much richness. The same speaker that talked about kind of we're not on the defensive, but on the offensive. You know, he said, yeah, the world's a mess, but who did God leave in charge? <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. So we have we have a role to play, right? That this That's part of being the church militant, right? We have a part of the vocation of baptism is to, is to help uh, restore the world. This is, I, this is what I love from John Paul II. Uh, I think it's uh, Christian Fidelis Leici. It's one of uh, the exhortations he wrote to the church. He said, it's the role of laymen and women to restore to creation all of its original dignity. Wow. Right. And which, yeah. which, and so if you think about it, it sounds like he's talking about reversing the effects of the fall, which of course he is, right? Because that's, that was Jesus's mission, right? To bring yeah. healing and restoration. And so we've got to do it. So uh, it can't, it's Jesus, Jesus did his part, yeah. right? It, he, it's complete. He redeemed the world right now. He calls each of us to go into the world and invite others to experience uh, the reality of his love and forgiveness and mercy and to work for the restoration, like to apply the power yeah. of his, uh, uh, of his kind of redemption right into the world. I just, yeah. That's exciting to me too. Yeah, I, we should talk more because I'm ready to. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go right now. Well, and that also reminds me of um, Keith. What's that scripture verse that you love so much about? Um, it's not just words, but power. Oh, one Corinthians chapter four, verse twenty. Right, that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. Yeah. Uh, but of power, I do. I own amplified translation of that too. I said the kingdom <laughs> of God is not a matter of strategic planning. The kingdom of God is not a matter mm-hmm. of development. The kingdom of God is not even a matter of morality, oh, right? Yeah. The kingdom of God is uh, not a matter of talk, but of power. And Paul uses that word dunamis there, right? Which, which is where we get the word dynamite and dynamic, right? So, yes. so Paul's talking about the explosive life-changing power of God. And so yeah. I always say like Christianity without the power to, to change and transform and to heal and to restore yeah. It's just a philosophy. It is a philosophy. Yeah. yeah. Right. But, but, but the world's had enough of philosophy yeah. and I think it needs a life changing encounter with the love yeah. of the father in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy spirit. And so this is, this is what we're called to do. But I, again, I think it's a, it's a sense of the church has n- not in her teaching, but in the living out of our, our life as in parishes and dioceses. I think we've forgotten that yeah. identity, right? We've forgotten who we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that's a, that's a, a challenge to us. So kind of what you talked about, honestly, Jim was, is just like this thing is an incredible call, right. To step up. Yeah. I, it actually reminds me way uh, in the midst, in the mists of time in like 19, maybe 2000, 2001, I had a blog. Uh, and I call, I, I called the, the dynamis, Is that what it is? <laughs> no, but that was, oh. <laughs> That was the that first was a blog that post I read from you. I I saw a blog post for, on your your old website. And in fact, yeah. I just just this week I tried to Google it, and I don't think it's up anymore. No, but it I, isn't. That 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 blog post. Boom goes the dynamis. Number one. <laughs> Props for the the culture reference. It's so funny, but I absolutely love that. And you're you know, I was just thinking of that as you yep. mentioned this word. Yeah, because right, I was reflecting on on the kingdom of God as, as the reality of God's power. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but I forgot that I called it that. <laughs> we need to get that one back. Tell me it's saved on your hard drive. It is, it, I, I do believe it's saved. I think I might've reprinted it. Yeah. I hope I have uh, in my, on my new website, yeah. but I had a, wait, I had wait, a blog. I derailed you from what you were actually. That's okay. It's all right. Cause I love, 
<laughs> I, I got to find it, right? Because then you wrote you wrote a series of blog posts on the kingdom of God and power as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the power of God and suffering, I think was the, um, the, the, the piece in there. And so I was just like, whoa, that was amazing. Um, no, I had a blog called Take Your Place. Oh, wow. That mm. was the name of the blog, right? Because, mm. because it was really a blog for laymen and women right? Mm-hmm. To, uh, to heed the call, to, to discover their gifts and to step out into the reality of, of what God was calling them to do. And I think that's the, you know, that's what Jesus is asking us to do. Take yeah. your place. It, it's like we've forgotten. Most Catholics don't even recognize that we have the power and the authority from Jesus, yeah. Yeah. right? Not because of our goodness, but because of his merit, right? Not ours. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what Jesus is asking us is not go find the power to do this. No, he's already given it to us. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's now take your place. Yeah. Right. Or as JP2 said, become what you are. Become yeah. what you are. Right. I, I, I just think that's the, that, that's the call to mission. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's, and this is the beautiful thing, right? We say in the church that there's a universal call to holiness, but there's also a universal call to mission and they can't be separated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, and so as you grow in, in who you are, right. Living out what Jesus has, has made you right through the sacrament of baptism, that regeneration, and then gifted you, um, then you start living it out and it, it gets released into the world. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's also like maybe a need to almost unpack or debunk the word mission. Cause I, I think a lot of us, at least I did growing up in the church, associate that with a go work hard, go do things, yeah. go like, and it, it actually is very much not about that and more about learning how to partner with the Holy spirit and how yeah. to, almost like funnel the the power of the Holy spirit mm-hmm. into the places that need to receive that power. I think 100%. You're, I mean, it's right there when, when you have a culture that doesn't have space for dunamis, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't have space for God's power. Yeah. I, and I like, I think it's really interesting in many ways, culturally, not, I'm not talking about the church's teaching or the, the lived history of the church in terms of the lives of the saints, but culturally in the 21st century, it seems as if, for Catholics, the proof of God's presence is an absence of his, of his working, right? In other words, mm-hmm. like we, we know God must be in this because he's making us walk this on our own. Ooh. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, like, oh, this is really requiring faith because right. I'm not seeing anything happen. So it's right. just like, oh man. So, oh. so it's, so it's like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> So, I mean, that, so we, we kind of take that as proof because we don't have the fundamental experience, yeah. wow. right? That, that no, God, God gives life in Christ is supernatural life, yeah. right? Wow. It's oriented towards eternity, right? Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's, it brings the natural to perfection, yeah. right? But it's oriented towards eternity. So God gives us the supernatural life so yes. that we would become like him. And so that we can accomplish, we can, we can kind of finish in a sense, the work that he began uh, Mm -hmm. when he gave himself and offered the universe redemption. Right. And Mm -hmm. so this is a part and parcel of who we are. Father Matthias Thalen, uh, who's a priest in, I think Michigan now. um, He, he said this, I'll never, I I think it was, um, I think he, he had a book called, I think the biblical role of healing. And one of the things he said in the introduction is that he has become convinced that healing is an essential component of the gospel. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and basically he said it, that it should really become part and parcel. We should expect that God is going to move powerfully miracles, healings, those things. Yeah. Um, uh, and he goes, but it's not the whole of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he said, it's not the whole of the gospel, but he said, he's become convinced that the gospel isn't whole without it. Oh, yes. wow. Right. And, yeah. and I think we sort of, we assume that there's this, there's this beautiful phrase, uh, Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, right. That, that we mm-hmm. talk about in the church, right. The law of prayer is the law of belief. And so if you want to know what the church believes, listen to how she prays. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And if you want to know what the people of God believe, listen to how we pray. Yeah. And when yeah. we, when we pray that God would move the hands of surgeons and that yeah. God would, would help you know, the diagnosticians kind of get a sense of what's going wrong, but we don't pray in that moment that in the name of Jesus Christ, like all dysfunction in the body, right. Be healed. What, what we're really saying is we don't believe God is going to work in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, 
And so we have to move to a place where we really understand, right? Yeah. And are living in the in the heart of this, that God's supernatural life is given to us so that we can make an impact on the world and also for us to grow in holiness. See, this is the thing. You cannot separate holiness and mission. Yeah. yeah. And so this idea of of sort of redeeming, if I could use that phrase, the word mission, yeah. right? So that it's it's connected to this sense of cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Re- I love this phrase, releasing the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Like I don't I don't like talking about building the kingdom of God. I know that was big and popular, I think, in the eighties and nineties, like build the kingdom of God. Yeah. Because you can't really build the kingdom of God. It's God's kingdom, mm-hmm. right? But you can manifest the kingdom of God, yeah. mm-hmm. right? And I think for me, mission is about manifestation, right? The manifesting of the yeah. reality of the kingdom of God yeah. and and making the reality through the grace of God, making the reality of the kingdom present yes. on mm-hmm. earth, right? You know, all, all throughout this conversation, I, I keep kind of coming back to this, really this sacramental analogy, you know, that, Um, I think, you know, we were talking earlier about like, where is, where is power in the church? And we don't really, is it missing from our experience? And, and the one, one thought I had was, well, I think a lot of people do believe in the power of God alive in the church, but it's almost relegated to the sacraments, which are, and there's this tendency, I I feel like a tendency for us to take the highest thing and make it the only things, Mm. right? So in other words, Yes, the the uh, especially the mass, the source and summit of faith, like it is the the highest, um, shall we say, expression of worship, the highest expression of and the the most, for lack of a better word to say it, the most tangible presence mm-hmm. of God. But it doesn't mean he's not present elsewhere. The real right. presence doesn't mean fake presence elsewhere. It means something yeah. different. right? You know, <laughs> he's actually present in other ways. His power is actually present in other ways. And I think in the same way that maybe this could be a, a way for for people that this might be uh, unfamiliar to, to connect when we're talking about the power of God working through us to, to kind of connect it to the same way that the sacraments aren't something new, but they make the reality of the cross of Jesus present here and now and apply it to our present circumstances. We are meant to be in a sense, little sacraments in the same way we are supposed to be the same, uh, similarly be, vessels for making what Jesus did. And this comes back to you, Keith. We're not building the kingdom. We're making it present yes. through our yes to the Lord, through our acts of obedience, through our releasing it, through a prayer, through just an invitation to the Lord. So good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I'm, ex- I'm actually I'm excited about that, right? And in a sense, we're sacramentals, right? Yeah. But also, and again, I mean, I want to, maybe this would help too, drawing the connection that everything we've been talking about actually flows out of baptism. So it does flow out of the sacraments. So it's not an extra sacramental, like it's not like a, what's the word I'm thinking of? Like it's not a parallel path from the sacraments. It flows from the reality of baptism. At baptism, you know, the the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come and dwell within us, right? So the reality of the kingdom of God is made present in us. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and, and so from that flows all of the supernatural realities. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and just as Jesus was the anointed one, Christ, right. We become little Christs, right. Little anointed ones. It's yeah. like, it's like the flame of the love, you know, the love of the father made manifest, made incarnate in Jesus. Right. Now we're all like these little, this kindling that comes from that. Right. And then the Lord is tossing us into the world, right. To bring light and all that other stuff. And, but it flows from the, the sacraments. I think, I, I think yeah. we do, we have to wrestle with that because I think that's when people get really nervous, right? No, but yeah. there's the sacraments, right? Well, yeah, yeah. this is sacramental, right? Yeah. This is the reality of, of what God has given us in the sacraments. And that's why baptism is such a central and yeah. foundationally important sacrament, right? The church calls it the doorway to salvation, mm-hmm. right? Just simply because of that, that's where it all starts. So I love that. Yeah. I love your sacramental analogy because it brings the reality of of the power of God made manifest. I get way too excited when I talk with you guys. So. <laughs> and I even see this coming full circle because, you know, Keith, you're talking about how do we, or the need to shift the culture or to create a culture where there's room for the dunamis to show up, like yeah. that we can measure the presence of God, not by the fact that he's not showing up and it's requiring extra faith, but the fact that he did show up. Mm-hmm. And he is moving. And I think that brings us back to the whole value of testimony. Like yeah. if we were talking about this more, 
if we were talking about just how willing God is to move on our behalf or to move through us in power. And telling the stories of when it happened. Yeah, right? and not shying away from that, then maybe that can start to infiltrate the culture and create that space for him to show up again. Yeah, yeah I think it does, right? Because I think testimony testimony itself, right, begins to change the climate, yeah. right? And, and it can become a climate of expectation. 